Fellow Toastmasters, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am the facilitator for this presentation, and I'm going to show you something and allow you to listen to something. Now, there's a part in Toastmasters where you're supposed to be able to speak and read impromptu. Jerry gave me this about a few minutes ago, so I have not had a chance to practice. So let's see how a supposedly distinguished Toastmaster handles this. Here we go. No pressure. Okay. How to go from the back of the room to command the room. Our speaker today is a self-proclaimed addict for public speaking. He has an affliction and an affinity to speak as often as he can. It first began almost six years ago when he walked into his first Toastmasters meeting filled with self-doubt and lacking in self-confidence to speak in front of groups of people. He, con he contracted the speaking virus and has been gladly trying to infect others to pass it on and spread it to as many people as possible. Jerry is a passionate and energetic speaker, business owner, entrepreneur, CEO, which means Chief Encouragement Officer, of the awards, management, awards company that he started in 2005 after a successful corporate sales management career of 20 plus years in the consumer packaged goods industry. He describes himself as a former corporate slave and a refugee from Corpse America. He is most proud of the two black belt degrees he has earned, one in success and the other in failure. Whether your heart beats with excitement or tremors or trembles, trembles with the trepidation as you move towards the lectern or podium, it must be recognized public speakers who command the audience share certain characteristics. In this session, you will learn what makes one presenter persuasive and powerful and another weak and ineffective. We will, he will share five keys to help you become more directed, dynamic, powerful speaker, a presenter to capture and command the attention of any audience. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce distinguished Toastmaster and my brother from another mother, <laughs> Jerry Evans. Barry did his session. 
just more than less than 10 minutes ago. So what do you think some of those elements are, some of those attributes that makes one speaker really powerful and persuasive and another just kind of weak and ineffective? And I know we've all been in rooms where we've been totally enraptured and captivated by the speaker. And we've been in other spaces where you go, oh my God, why did I even come to this session today? My speaker is boring me out of my mind. Like, where's the red car? Right? It's like you want him to go from green in the first minute to red in the next two or three minutes. So what are some of those attributes? Anyone? Yes. Energy. Energy. Exactly. And your name is? Lori. Lori. So Lori, that's the number one, energy. You, as a speaker and a presenter, you bring your energy to the audience. Mm -hmm. If your energy is high, Lori, what's going to happen? People are going to... Exactly. You, just by your presence and by your energy, you've raised the energy of the audience. That also, the audience, they pick up on that either directly or indirectly, whether we think about it or not. If I come in the room, if Barry walked in the room today to do a session, so I'm going to teach you the art of storytelling today, and I'm going to teach you the seven elements, and, and that was his energy level, the vibe that he brought into the room, that's going to permeate the entire room. Okay, that's one E, and we call this Evans Law of Three. Three E's. So Lori mentioned one energy. What do you think is Eden? Enthusiasm. 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 When Barry got on the stage, was there any was there any doubt in your mind that he was excuse me enthusiastic about he was going to talk about it in his session? No. No doubt at all, right? No doubt. Just like Gwen Stefani in the group. No doubt. What do you think the third thirty is? Yes. Engagement. Engagement. Okay. That's that's a good E. We'll come back to that one about engagement. Someone else. What do you think another E is? Yes. Pardon me? Empathy. Empathy? Okay. I would ask you to consider this. How about excitement? So you have energy, you have enthusiasm, you have excitement, and engagement. We'll come back to that because it's very important in terms of how we engage an audience, and, and I'll walk you through some ways that we can do that. But those are the three E's. There are actually three elements. Barry talked about the seven elements of storytelling, and I'm going to refer back to Barry's session because it actually has a lot of application to this session. How do we go from the back of the room to command the room. When a speaker starts out, Prez talked about this in his session, when a speaker starts out, we're already making snap decisions about that speaker's credibility and their expertise based on a couple factors. The most important factor that we're making this judgment, what do you think that might be? How they look. Exactly. How they look, and Barry talked about one other thing, sound. Very important, how they look and how they sound. So when Barry was talking about sound, for example, it goes in a couple of different areas. <clears throat> Excuse me, we talk about sound, so it's pitch, tone, and inflection. Intonation, so you can tune your tone, because when we listen to speakers that are, you know, deaf by monotone, Okay. It's like death by PowerPoint sometimes. Yeah. It's just flat all the way through. There's no modulation. For was talking about this emotional roller coaster that we take people on. And we'll come back to the story and how that comes into play. So you've got this monotone in the beginning, and if that's how you start out, that's going to leave your audience flat, and they're not going to be as engaged as they could be when you do that. So let's get into the particulars of how do we go from the back of the room to command the room? I love this because I think it sums up those of us who are speakers and those of you who are presenters. <laughs> from the moment we're born, right, time we're in the cradle, until we stand up on stage, we don't have that fear. But all of a sudden we get in front of a group of people, and then all of a sudden your mind goes totally blank. Anybody ever blanked in a presentation or a speech? <laughs> Mark Twain said there are two types of speakers, those that are nervous and those that are liars. So figure which camp you're in, right? We've all blinked in presentations. We've all, you know, searching for that, you know, Perez was talking about gestures, and you've seen speakers look up like all of a sudden the answer, or that, that word or that phrase was up in the heavens. God was going to come down and say, Barry, 
Here's that sixth element right. of storytelling. <laughs> That usually, that usually doesn't happen. So the mind is a wonderful thing. It starts working from the moment we're born until the time we stand up to give a presentation or to give a speech. I love Martin Luther King, I Have a Dream, because I think that epitomizes when Barry was talking about sound. You know, we talk a lot about gestures, and we'll, we'll touch on that. But when you listen to that speech, and he's behind the lectern, you know, when he delivers, he's actually behind the podium. He doesn't need to be spinning plates. He doesn't need to be juggling balls. The power of the words that he communicates. He enraptured an audience in Washington of all half a million people on that day when he delivered that speech. And Barry was talking about those speeches that we remember for a long, 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 long time, the stories we remember. I guarantee probably the majority of us in this room remember a lot of the words, do I have a dream? That's how powerful and persuasive a speaker and a presenter can be. And he wasn't thinking about, you know, was he using the staging area? Was his gesturing right? Was he gesturing left? Was he center stage, upstage, downstage, no stage, any stage? He was just focused on delivering a compelling, powerful message. That's a powerful presenter and speaker. In contrast, how many of you would agree that Barack Obama is a excellent speaker presenter? Okay. How many <laughs> would, would agree that George Bush Jr. is a powerful no. speaker presenter? No. <laughs> no. No. So we go on down the line. So you got George Bush Sr., and of course you've got the peanut farmer. Jimmy Carter. So when you go through those, who would you say is the most persuasive, powerful speaker presenter out of the current and past presidents? Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton. Whatever your disposition is towards Bill, good, bad, or different, or the good, the bad, and the ugly, mm -hmm. he was very charismatic, yes. he was very persuasive, and he drew you in. Mm. You could, your mind could be wandering all these other things, but when he got up to present, he was probably one of the most accomplished, polished politicians that we've ever had in the office. You know, Ronald Reagan was referred to as the great communicator because of the way he was so warm and friendly and he engaged, you know, citizens. But next to that would be Bill Clinton. So you can see the contrast. So there are as many different personalities and messages as I would like to say I brought them with me as. Amy Sagami presented this morning. She had all these different colors of note cards. So we as speakers and presenters, all the different personalities and all the different messages are as different as colors in a crayon box. And yet we can be enraptured and captivated by a speaker's presenter. That's the difference between powerful and ineffective. The number one key, and Barry and I have had hours and hours of conversation about that, as a speaker and presenter, the number one thing I want you to take away from today is to be who you are as a speaker and to be true to your own message. Barry said in his session, again, I'll refer back to that, about <coughs> your story. I can't tell Barry's story no more than he can tell mine. Lori, I can't tell your story, but you can tell your story. Deb, I can't tell your story. You can't tell mine. When we try to be an imitation of another successful speaker, usually you just become a carbon copy. And yet, in Toastmasters, we go through this program, and somebody sees Barry present, or you know, now they see Perez, the world champion of public speaking, and I've had numerous people come up to me. Jerry, I want to be just like Perez. I'm like, no, you don't. No, Jerry, you don't understand. I want to be just like Prez. I'm like, no, you don't. Jerry, are you dense? Are you just slow? Or what's the deal? Well, I don't understand. Why don't I want to be like Prez? I said, because, first of all, you don't have a Bulgarian accent. You're not as good looking as Prez. <laughs> and you don't know how to change a tire. <laughs> so you can't be like Prez. The idea is not to be like Prez. It's to learn 
from some of the things he does really well, some techniques, some ideas maybe that you can incorporate into your own style and delivery of speaking, but you can't be pressed because you have your own unique message, your style of delivery, and that truly is very said in terms of a story that makes your story unique that only you can tell. Someone else can't tell that for you. And you don't have to deliver it perfectly. That's the other trap we get into in Toastmasters. We think that you have to be perfect when you deliver a speech or presentation. Really? <laughs> Barry's delivered this numerous times. Barry, is this session, is this presentation perfect yet? Uh -oh. No. So does practice make perfect? Yes, yes. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It makes it better. Practice, let's show you hands. Practice makes perfect. No, no. Okay? Practice makes improvement. Yeah, yeah. Progress. Better. Yeah. Refining, revising a speech. Yeah. Ask Press. How many times did he revise and refine his world championship speech? Barry won in 2012 on the same speech that, Pete, that, that Press gave in 2013. But he revised it, he refined it 200, 300, 400 times. And any of us who's been to his session, he dissected that speech word by word, phrase by phrase, gestures, expressions, everything that he talked about earlier in his session, how to you know, go from the stage to engage your audience. So don't think it's about perfection. It's about us being present, being in the moment. Because the speech you delivered today and the message that you delivered today, you're never going to reach 100% of the audience, ever. But if maybe my message resonates today with Lori, or resonates with someone else in the audience that day, that's okay. You don't have to touch everyone. Because on any given day, it's just like contests, right, Dean? Your speech could win on that day, based on the judges, based on the vibe, the, the judges, etc. But then another day, that speech might fall on deaf ears. It's what you deliver today. So get this notion of perfection out of your mind. So number one, key, be you. you. Be you. Be true to yourself as a speaker and to your message. Let's talk about some of those people that we recognize. Some of them you may recognize, maybe perhaps not all of them. Anyone know who that is? Oh, Carly Simon. Carly Simon, famous singer-songwriter. Barbara Streisand. Carol Burnett had one of the longest running variety shows on television. Springsteen. Bruce Springsteen, the boss. Mel Gibson. Mel Gibson. And Johnny Carson. Now, why would I show this slide, Famous Through Fear? All of them are very talented entertainers, singers, songwriters in their own right. But one I want to focus on in particular because this is where we make assumptions about speakers, presenters, talk show hosts, late night show, talk show hosts. Of course, Jimmy Fallon took over for Jay Leno, and then, you know, prior to that, of course, was Johnny Carson for 25 years. Well, Johnny, what you may not have known, is that Johnny Carson had a resting heart rate of 65 beats per minute. And before he would go on, walk through that curtain, and Ed McMahon would say, here's Johnny. He was hooked up to a blood pressure machine, to a heart monitor, I should say. So his resting heartbeat went from 65 beats per minute to 165 beats per minute, right before he walked through that curtain. Now keep in mind, for 25 years he had the same staff, the same production people, it was the same set, the same curtain. Ed McMahon, every night he introduced Johnny, and yet every single night, he hooked himself up, measured his heart rate, resting heart rate, and then how it accelerated. And Johnny was an avid tennis player. He played tennis three to four times a week. So he was a pretty healthy individual. But he still had that nervousness and that anxiety. But he channeled it, so when he walked through that curtain, what did we see? A cool, collected, calm Johnny Carter. And then it became a conversation. It wasn't a speech. It wasn't a presentation. He made the guests feel warmly welcome at home, at ease. He could joke all about all sorts of things. And you think about all those guests that sat in that chair over the years. And Johnny, night after night after night, 
gave us a wonderful show. So this is something. So is the answer with Jerry. All you got to do is just get up there and you just got to do it. Yesterday I sat with someone and we were talking about presentations and speaking. And she said to me, and I won't use her name, actually the conversation occurred today. And we were talking about preparation versus winging it, or what I like to call showing up and throwing it. <laughs> you ever listen to a few of those speeches? Wing it and slinging it? Oh, I can talk about anything. Barry's talking about, you know, you're a child, and they can talk, 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 talk. But what are they really saying when they speak? Is the message really clear? There's no clarity at all in the message. So the answer isn't just to do it, which leads us to the thing that's also critical to your success as a speaker and presenter in terms of going from the back of the room and commanding them. My question to all of you, are you prepared? Are you prepared? What constitutes preparation, Sherry, for you? Okay. Sherry, share that with your group. It's okay. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> well, well, yeah, I was the person who was And you're on about. tape, too. So, so. <laughs> yes. Um, we can was, edit it, by the way. Yeah, we can edit you. Don't worry. <laughs> it, 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 I, I usually really write my speeches on the fly. It's usually maybe an hour before I go to speak. <laughs> and I write down the, the topic and the points that I want to make, and then I wing it. And wow. I think I'm good, but you know, <laughs> I think I do well. I, you, I, I, I to, to my own credit, and I to my own heart, yes. I have beat Charles Brooks, the distinguished toastmaster, several times in our, in our club contest. So, just so you know, <laughs> <laughs> just so you know, we can have a whole other so, conversation yeah. about that. Uh, Jerry. Exactly. So, are you prepared? So, what is what was preparation? What does that constitute? Number one key to successfully speaking and presenting and going from the back of the to command the audience is preparation. And I'm going to give you an easy acronym. It's not really an acronym. It's kind of a formula. And Barry's seen me do this before. But I call it the five P's. There's five P's up there. And it's real easy. And this is going to change the way you prepare for your speeches and your presentation. You ready for it? I'm ready. Okay, I'm ready. here we go. Proper preparation prevents presentation predicaments. predicaments. Oh, wow. Proper preparation prevents presentation predicaments. Because 75% of speaking, successfully speaking, is all about preparation. 15% is breathing, and the other 10% is mindset. So if 75% is attributed to proper preparation, do you think it makes sense to spend, let's see, preparing your speech or presentation in a parking lot? No. If they're going to pay you, Lori, $5,000 or $10,000 or pay Carolyn $25,000 to give a presentation, she go, well, you know what, I'll just kind of wing it, I'll get up there and just see what happens, see if I really make my points, if I'm concise, precise, if I really have clarity in my message. I don't think so. Because if she does that, what's going to happen if you're a professional speaker in particular, let alone an amateur speaker, is that you'll never get asked back again. So she may be leaving a whole lot of money on the table by not probably preparing herself. But and if you think of any famous musician, singer, songwriter, would they, headlining a perform uh, an important performance, would they not spend hours and hours rehearsing? No. Would any famous athlete in a crucial game match or meet forego any conditioning exercises, strength, strength conditioning? And they go, well, you know what? I'll just go Super Bowl. I'll just go out there and get out on the field and yeah, just wing it. I just run down the field and see if I can catch that pass. No. And it's no different with speakers. Practice, 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 and preparation will make you better when the real event takes place. Because what you do in practice, not perfect practice, but constantly refining and working on your presentation speech and really having it down pat. And I asked Sherry, I said, Sherry, could you give me your speech if I woke you up in the middle of the night? And she said, yes, I can give you my, didn't you say, Sherry? She said, Sherry, if you woke me up in the middle of the night, I could still deliver my contest speech like that. 
That's how well you want to be prepared. Because you know why? It's not memorizing it, it's internalizing it. Because if you can deliver it naturally and organically, it'll come out more of a conversation rather than a presentation. Because as Barry said again in his session, anybody can give a speech, anybody can give a presentation. But deliver it naturally and organically. And more, most importantly, when we think about all these techniques in speaking, here's, here's, here's a little extra. Nothing beats authenticity. Authenticity beats technique. Any day of the week. Any day of the week. Exactly. And Lori brings up a good point, and, and, and I want to I emphasize this because sometimes when you're giving a presentation, you're giving a speech, and you go, oh my God, I forgot something. Like, okay, Lori, did the audience know your speech? Did they know what you left out? Did they know what you're going to add? Did they know where you're going to emphasize certain points? Did Barry, did he decide, well, I'm going to go stage right or stage left or center stage or upstage or, you know, am I going to do my gestures inbound or outbound, etc.? Your audience doesn't know that. Only you know that. So you continue on. You press on. So we need to move on. Number three, body language. Press talked about that this morning. And we talked about it when, when Deb said, you know, your visual presence, Press called it your visual message. But your visual presence, because people are sizing us up. If I got up here today and I had a t-shirt on, had stains on, and had jeans on, and sandals. My kind of man. Visually. <laughs> we can talk later. Your impression of me as a speaker presenter might be a little bit different, wouldn't it? Yeah. And how many times have you listened to, watched the speaker and presenter, and you look how they're dressed, and it's not that's not the only criteria. But if you look how they're dressed, and if Sherry was giving a presentation on leadership, but she was dressed, looked like she just woke up, just rolled out of bed, how much credibility would she have? Would you trust her expertise? You go, she's going to talk to me about leadership? No. I don't think so. So be very aware of your visual presence and how you look. If you're giving a critical, important presentation or speech, Make sure you're dressed appropriately. I'm not here to try to tell you how to dress, but just to be aware of it. Because there was a book written a long time ago called Dress for Success. Anybody ever read that? Yes. It's, 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 it's a classic. And we never get a second chance to do what? First impression. First impression. So speakers and presenters, that's certainly true. So body language. So what makes up body language? 55% of it is your body movements. Your face, your arms, your expressions, all the things that Press spoke about earlier today in a second, speaking to engage an audience. And by the way, I'll send you this PowerPoint presentation, so if you don't get all the notes, because I'm going to give you some handouts later on. So 55%, which is the majority of it, and that's a lot of it, is the visual. 55%. Yeah, it impacts an audience that you're presenting to. 38% is your most your voice, your tone, your modulation, your inflection, kind of taking them on that emotional roller case, poster. and yet only 7% of it is the words that we use in a presentation. Look at the contrast between, so 50, you know, hearing, seeing Barack Obama on your left, my right. Pardon? Who's your left? My left, too. <laughs> it's your body language. You can see the difference between the two. If you look at her eyes, if you look at how he's got his hands down, and the president's talking about, you know, people are in prayer. But that's how our body communicates our message, or doesn't communicate our message. This is something I observe watching female presenters and speakers. If you watch a lot of female presenters and speakers, that like, you'll see them crossing over. Or someone said, Jerry, I call that the vine. You know how a vine, a grapevine, is kind of twisted? Watch speakers. After today, watch some speakers. And you'll see that female speakers a lot of time will be like this, or they're like this. And so what that does, and, you know, talking, you know, Perez was talking about stance, that puts you off balance. You don't have a solid stance. So watch female speakers. And you'll notice that a lot of them do that. 
And that takes away and it distracts from your, your presentation and from your speech. Stories. I couldn't leave this out without talking about stories. And that's why I said this will reinforce what Barry was talking about and what Pres was talking about. When Barry was talking about a song, and you, you know, said, well, why is song first, right? Song in terms of the last element? It, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, sound. But if you think of your speech as a song, and what you write down are the lyrics, and how you say it is the music. And that's the sound. When Barry's talking about the sound, we all have a sound. Every single one of us. Even though you may not know exactly what your sound is, you definitely have a sound. And you can go back and listen to the greatest speeches and presentations to the 20th and 21st century, and it's not what they said, but how they said it. You listen to the, you know, you listen to Martin Luther King, you listen to JFK, you look at, listen to uh, Maya Angelou, who just passed away. You listen to any great speaker presenter and listen to how they say it, not just the words that they use. That's the power of stories. We call this the biggest what if, and Barry alluded to this, is that, what if you've got nothing to say? What if no one ever have an interest in hearing what you've got to say? Well, they shouldn't, because each and every one of us has experiences and knowledges that we can share with an audience that needs to hear that message. Not from me, perhaps, not from you, but maybe someone else. And it may resonate with them. So never diminish that you have something to share. Every single one of us has something to share. Share your story. Goes back to, again, in the very beginning, be, be you. Share your story. Be you. And then, you know, preparation. And then, once you do that, I kind of like to use focus. Follow one path. Perez was talking about in his first session, in a keynote about, you know, using one story, especially for in a contest where you're delivering a speech that's five to seven minutes, or Barry and I have talked about time and time again, 450 seconds. You have 450 seconds, seven minutes and 30 seconds to deliver your message to the world. On the big stage, we talked about this, is that if you were giving that message to God, what would you say in five minutes to seven minutes and 30 seconds? That's the big picture of things. What would you say? What would you want? Deliver. So follow one course and you're successful. Focus. Focus, focus, focus. Focus on your preparation, your practice, your rehearsal, crafting that story, that powerful, compelling story. And closing this out, guts. You know, we can sit in these sessions, you can listen to Barry, you can listen to Perez, you can listen to me, other presenters and speakers, but it's not what you learn in this session right now. It's what you do with the information after you leave here today. And how you apply it. Because if you do nothing after you leave the session today, then you haven't made the best use of the investment of your time, because you can never <coughs> get that time back. Take Barry's information, the information today, and then go apply it. Work with it, play around with it, go back to your clubs, and take and make as many speaking opportunities as you possibly can. Because we know as Toastmasters, we get better, we learn by doing. And doing, and practicing, and practicing. Because you continue to do that, then you can go from the back of the room to command the room, but more important, you'll have command of you. You'll take command of you as a speaker and presenter. And when they talk about owning the stage, you will own the stage. And I just touched on three things this afternoon. I didn't give you five. I'll email you the other two, so I want to leave you with those other two. But GUT stands for go use this stuff. <laughs> I wasn't talking about the physical, but go use this stuff. And then the other thing I like to I like to drive back to or give you an analogy to is that get up to speak. Because you know we talk about failure a lot. And this is kind of the bonus part. When we think of failure in Toastmasters, well, if you haven't figured this out on your own yet, there are no failures or mistakes in Toastmasters. Oh, Jerry, no, no, no. I've made tons of mistakes. When I said in my introduction, Barry said, you know, about success and failure. 
No, there's only been different outcomes and different results in some of my speeches and some of my presentations. Because the only way any of us in Toastmasters, in this organization, in the 90 year history, that any of us could possibly fail is that if you stay seated in the chair mm -hmm. and you never get up to speak up and let your, and let your voice be heard. Because you know what? Even if you're bad, I mean really, really bad, people will respect the courage it takes because you had the courage to stand up, let your voice be heard. And sometimes that fear, you know, that little inner voice comes into our head saying, oh yeah, but it may not be perfect, you may get this right. What if I do this? What if I, what if I do this? Who cares? In the overall scheme of things, it's a drop in the ocean. It really is. So take and make as many speaking opportunities as you can. So go hit that guts button. Go out so that you can go from the back of the room, the command room, take Barry's information, the information that Chris shared with you this afternoon and some of the other presenters and apply it to your speaking and your presentations. As I said, I will have two handouts be with you. And this, this is a way that you can rate yourself as a speaker and presenter. And so when you take this home, rate yourself how, on a scale of one to 10, how you think you are as a speaker presenter. And then once you look at that, go back 60 days from now. And then rate yourself again. And see which areas that you've improved on and gotten better at. Because the only way it's going to get better is when you get better and you practice, apply these things, work on your body language, your gestures, all those things, those are all tools for us to use. So I think we have like two minutes. So I'll take a couple quick questions. If anyone has any comments, I would appreciate it. Feedback is always warmly welcome. Questions. So I'm Sherry. curious enough because of the fact that the, the way I told you I did my mm -hmm. speeches, what is what is the way that you start off writing your speeches? Then, how do you? What is your preparation for writing your speeches? Well, everybody's process is a little bit is a little bit different. Um, yeah, we can. Yeah. The other form, well, Barry's Barry's passed on another one. It's a presentation evaluation form, so you can take this form also. And you can distribute it, and you can let someone else give you feedback on it, but it's also a form that you can use to gauge your own feedback. Self-evaluate. Tim, in fact, did a session, The Art of Self-Evaluation. So you can watch a video of yourself, and you can use this form to evaluate yourself in a lot of different areas. But to answer your question, Chair, everybody's process is a little bit different. What I normally do is every single day I'm always looking, I have an idea file, and I'm always looking for different ideas, topics, and subjects to speak on. Because sometimes it's postmaster. Well, gee, Carol, how many times have we heard? Well, I don't know what to talk about. <laughs> and you heard ideas for speeches are what? Everywhere. Around. Ideas are all around you. They're everywhere. So first coming up with an idea, that's the way my process. So think about that idea. And then I start to think about what's the purpose of the speech? Is it to inform? Is it to persuade? Is it to educate, entertain, etc.? Then I drill that down. What's the purpose of it? And then, of course, the question becomes, what do I want the audience's takeaway to be? Various speakers, you've heard, you know, what do you want them to think, feel, do, etc. So what do you want the audience to take away from it? What is that result of that outcome that you're looking for? And then I start outlining it and then, you know, doing my points. And the way my process works, everybody's different. And then I start to write it out because then by writing it out, that helps me to internalize it. And as I'm writing it, I can visualize and I can feel, you know, the words. Are the words resonating? We didn't get into emotion. Not that we could spend hours talking about emotion in, in presentations and speeches. But then I start to feel that. I'm like, okay, does this resonate? And then start to craft it. And that's just the first draft. Uh, Barry and his contest speech, 300 times, 350. Practice? Yeah. Oh yeah, three, four, five hundred times. Right. Literally. I mean, when you wake up, the hardest part is when you're competing, is when it's over, the first thing you say, well, what else do I have to talk about? Because you've been practicing for so right. long, and my son said, Star Wars is on, and I'm like, I don't want to talk about Star Wars, I've been talking about it for six months, you know, so. And you, and you lived present with that speech for two years. Yeah. 
when he delivered that to Barry, when Barry won district mm -hmm. and went to uh, went on to the world championship, he worked on that speech for two years. Now, there's a rule of thumb. Anybody ever read the book Outliers? Mm -hmm. Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. Yeah. You know what the rule is? I'm not sure. No. Okay. In in the book Outliers, which reminds me, I've got some suggested reading for you all. In the book Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell says that for every minute, for every minute or hour that you present, for every minute that you present, you should spend one hour preparing. They call it the 10,000 hour rule. If you want to become an expert in everything, in anything, you spend 10,000 hours becoming an expert in that subject, that topic. So think of us as speakers and presenters. So for every minute that you present or speak, you spend an hour crafting that speech. And I can tell you from Barry, from Greg Thompson, from other you know, serious Toastmasters, they will tell you they spent hours and hours and hours. They've gone to different clubs and practiced that speech again and again and again. So but the speech that you write, yes. is that the speech you deliver? No, not necessarily. Oh. So then that's what that, that was. Very speech, when he first started that, I give you a gamble, B, and you can, Symphon, oh, Symphon, when Barry first crafted that speech, and I first heard it, I said, B, that, that's, that's awesome. Now he talked about, we're talking about sound, we're talking about music, right? And I said, B, I go, there's one element missing. He's like, wait a minute, I'm covering all seven elements in the speech, in the story. I'm like, no, you're missing one thing. All right, what is it? Go from there. You tell it. Music. The music. Because I was talking that speech is making a comparison to what I really believe. When you look at what Mozart did, that's what we do every day. That's what we do every day, and I alluded to that in my speech, that he's been gone for 217 years, but his sound is still here. So when you speak, I don't care if it's a club of one person, that's your sound. That's what people are going to remember you right. by. So don't ever just come up and say, I'm doing speech number 10. No. <laughs> this should be <laughs> symphony number 10. And if you weren't there, you missed it. Oh my God, you missed yeah. my speech? Okay, I'm going to do another speech. <laughs> Number 11, it's going to be even better. That's what you should approach it by. And you should be, to your thing, be two people. Don't make right. it, you know, people like to make it technical. Be two people. Be the person who's writing the speech, and then be the person who's actually listening. Right. So when I did my Jedi speech, the original part was when I was talking about where the lightsaber was. And originally I said, you didn't know who a Jedi was because the Jedi would have their lightsabers underneath their robes. And my original thing was to have it underneath my suit, and it's, and I'm like, I'm a six foot one black man with a stick. No, maybe I don't want to do Okay? I didn't see it at first. I was practicing to a female friend of mine. She looked at me like, oh, maybe that doesn't work. <laughs> or just take yourself and hear yourself and go, that didn't sound anything the way I meant that to sound. Because every speech, so that, that took his speech, that took that to a whole nother level. When he first did that, I mean, that's when I'm sitting there listening, I'm like, Barry, that's beautiful. Because the music, just didn't you feel that later on? So you could take Perez's speech, when he first gave that speech, it didn't even resemble the speech he wound it up with when he won the World Championship. But that could be said of Ed Hearn's speech, you know, anyone who's taken it that far. Because you start to hear that, and then you start to really get into it and just feel the words and the emotion of, of all that. But anyway, before you leave. But before you start, yes, sir. though. Some of us on this side didn't get the handouts. Yeah. So if you can email them to if you, us. If something. you will please, yeah. yeah. Let me give you my email address. I forgot okay. on the screen real quick. Well, Jerry's doing it. If you can't, as you're preparing your speech, and I talk about passion being the element, if you yes. can't cry or laugh right. at your own speech, then it's not, then the audience is not going to feel it. When I wrote my speech about being homeless, there was a line on there because it's been so long ago that I remember it was 4 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday, and I literally wrote that the hardest part about being homeless, no, I couldn't, I, I used to envy the guys that could sing and dance, because right. I can't sing and I can't dance. But no one wants to hear biochemistry from a bum, and I'm tearing up thinking about it because you have to go, I had to go back to that moment to bring that up to the speech. And the hardest part of me practicing was, how do I practice without bawling on the stage? 
But I knew that if I felt it, someone else was going to feel it. So if you're not crying or laughing at your own speech, the only reason I haven't won the humorous speech contest is because every time I keep practicing to my girlfriend in the back, I'm like, okay, I got a speech. It's ready. It's really funny. She sits in. I'm doing a speech, and I'm just going along, going along. And at the end, you know, ladies, how you can look at your, your man like, yeah, honey. And she goes, she looks at me like, I have one question. What's that? Isn't it supposed to be funny? I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> you got my email address. I will email you. Tim and Tim's recording this, so he'll have that posted so you can watch it again. But I will email you all the forms. Email me. And then uh, before I leave you, I'll email in the email. There's, there's some different books that I'd like you to consider and think about putting in your, your library. One, I just had an opportunity. Some of you may have gone to it to hear Vicus Jingham called Emote. Excellent book. It's all it's about, it's no, I shouldn't say all it's about, but it's talking about emotion. How we use the power of emotion in telling a story. And Barry, he does. I mean, he talks about it just related to story. Not as a speech or presentation, but as story. So that's an excellent book. He called Emote. The other thing, which he was, she was Darren LaCroix's mentor, it's called The Message of You by Judy Carver. The who message? The Message of You by Judy Carver. Again, I'll email me. And I'll give you all this, but I just wanted to share it with you quickly. For those of you that give a lot of business presentations, I had an opportunity to speak at NBC and to speak to their best salespeople, to a group of 45 top-level salespeople. The least amount any salesperson made was a quarter of a million dollars a year. Now think about us as Toastmasters. You're coming in, my background is sales and marketing. But you talk about I have tremors and trepidation. Mm -hmm. Speaking to these people, I'm like, oh my God. And this helped me. It's called the Tell to Win. It's about using the power of stories for business presentations. Powerful book. Peter Gruber, he produced Rand Man, uh, Batman, The Color Purple. He was the president and CEO of Sony Polygram Records. The man knows how to tell a story. And he gives you an example in there where he blew a quarter of a billion dollar deal by forgetting, as Barry talked about, the art of storytelling. He just related facts, figures, statistics, and ratings. And he had to walk away from the table. $250 million for So I will email this to you. And so again, thank you for attending the session today. Good luck in your speaking and your presentation. Thank you. Let's give Barry a hand.